Hello, Cherish viewers. This is Beyond the Pitch, and today we have with me somebody who's played his football. In, he played his football in Israel. He played in UK and South Africa as well. Without much ado, I introduce to you John Pintel. But before we start, let's take a break. John Pintel is a former Ghanaian professional footballer. He played for clubs both inside and outside of Ghana, including Berkum Arsenal, Liberty Professionals, Maccabi Tel Aviv, Hapoel Tel Aviv, West Ham United, Fulham, Leicester City, Santos and Maritzburg United and internationally for Ghana. A player comfortable at the right back or in the midfield, Pintel had stints in the native Ghana with Berkum Arsenals and Liberty Professionals and a brief spell with Polish side Widu Lodz before moving to Israeli club Maccabi Tel Aviv in 2002. Paintsill was a member of the Ghana Under-21 team who were runner-up in the FIFA World Youth Championship in Argentina in 2001 and played for the senior team in the African Cup of Nations in Mali in 2002 and Egypt in 2006 and was also a member of the Ghana 2004 Olympics football team who were excited in the first round in Greece having finished in third place in Group B. Painsell played in all the matches of Ghana's national team in the 2006 World Cup Finals, where Ghana were beaten by Brazil in the second round. Following the first and second goals in Ghana's 2-0 victory over the Czech Republic on 17 June 2006, he celebrated by waving an Israeli flag. He also waved as the final whistle blew. This action provoked some protest in the native country Ghana and the Arab world. Afterwards, the Ghanaian Football Association issued an apology and said of Painsell he was naive. He was a member of the Ghanaian 2010 World Cup team that reached the quarterfinals in South Africa before losing to Uruguay. He played in all five games. On 13 June 2010, in the World Cup group stage match against Serbia, another variation of his name appeared on his jersey, Painstill. On 27 June 2016, Painstill became the new assistant manager of Kaiser Chiefs. Now, John, let's talk about the young John. Before football, what were you doing? I was a student. A student, yeah. okay. Of which school? New job in College of Commerce. Okay, so what made you go into football? Yeah, I think uh, I was gifted. The chance just came. I was only playing for fun. Okay. Uh, before I joined uh, Bukumas Nas from Division 3 to Division 1. Then the team had a friendly match against the National Under 20 at that time, 2000, the year 2000, getting into 2001. Mm -hmm. It was coached by Mehiso Rest in Peace, Coach Ike Afrani. Okay. So um, after the match, I got a call up to join the national team. Okay. So I'm not, a, I wasn't a player who started from the academy or trying to. The national team, as you said, the late coach I found about you. Did you have the support from the family? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I was in school, like I said. Um, everything was going well. And my parents tried to make sure that in academic, uh, I'll be able to be okay after my school if I want to pick the job, any job that, yeah. But nobody planned that in future I'll become a, a professional footballer. Okay. But if not football, what would, what would you be doing right now? Yeah, I would have been a policeman. Why policeman? Because my dad was a police officer okay. and I followed him everywhere. Okay. Uh, they transferred him from one region to another. So I think I was admiring his, his, uh, his work. And yeah, being a police uh, barracks boy, I saw that that job was very great, more disciplined and all. Because myself, I'm a very disciplined person. Mm -hmm. Discipline as in how? Where very straight, straight, very straight okay. and uh, honest and also peacemaker okay. at the same time. Yeah. Family, family, uh, what role did your late mother play in your football career? Um, may her soul raise in peace. Um, she was my everything. Mm -hmm. and she, I think, 
with all my all my career, I think she was the one who was behind uh, my successful career, and I own her to that. And everywhere she is, I know uh, I hold her a high esteem. And I don't think without her, I would have uh, end up uh, being or get to where I was able to to get in my football career. My mom was everything in all. I mean, when I'm going to play, I would just call her. I'm playing today. She will sit down and play until the end of the game. So she played a very, very vital uh, role in my career. Okay. You played uh, Brickham Arsenal, then joined Liberty Professionals, then back to Brickham Arsenal. What was your experience in the Ghana football? Yeah, it was a great experience at that time. At that time, the league was very tough, competitive. Um, the local players were sometimes compete with the international ma for the international matches. Um, sometimes there was a time when we used only Hustle Folk team to play against Green Eagles, Nigeria, mm -hmm. and Ghana here. That tells you how competitive at that time the league was. So the experience between the two sides could see that uh, Liberty Professionals were more more ahead of uh, Bukumas as in terms of uh, structures and then facilities and Liberty Professionals were playing scientific football and Bukumas were playing direct so that's the difference between the two. The experience was also seeing a lot of crowds whenever we play in a Casper Stadium that was a great one. Who introduced you Liberty Professional? Yeah, they came for me. Okay. Yeah, they came for me. That was after under 20 uh, World Cup in Argentina. Okay. So they bought you with a huge amount of money at that time? Oh, yeah, at that time, there was a decent money. Mm, like how much? Uh, oh, I can't disclose it, but it was the money that uh, I used to buy my first pot in oh. Tema. Yeah. Okay. Now, you left the shores of Ghana to Israel uh, to play for Maccabi Tel Aviv. Uh, how was your experience, your first time moving outside the country? Um, to join like, a professional team like that? Like I said, uh, I didn't know what football would, would give me at that time. I mean, playing for Ghana under-20 uh, team, playing in Argentina, we played in the final against the host nation. And still I was having fun. Mm -hmm. Came back, a lot of uh, agents were chasing me that this club wants you, this one wants you. I went to Denmark. From Denmark, they sent me to Norway. Uh, I think uh, I visited many, many clubs before coming back to play for even Liberty Professionals. Okay. So Which, going to what, what are some of these clubs? Um, I can't remember because okay. at that time I wasn't even focusing on. Okay. Yeah, like nowadays players will change for clubs where they want to go. For me, like the chance just came like that. But I didn't even focus on putting attention on it. So going to Israel was it was easier because I've gone for a lot of trials and all. And going to Israel, Maccabi Tel Aviv, it was supposed to be a trials, one man trials. Okay. So the day I got to Tel Aviv, I had a I had my first match, same day. So after the match, the coach who said he wants to see me one man said no, he wants my signature the following day. Ooh. So I was lucky uh, to fall into um, that system. So I, I signed my contract so everything started moving smoothly. So you had in mind that you're going to play and get back to Ghana to join you, to play for your, your former club. But you didn't know that the trials rather ended you being part, I mean, the, asking for your signature to be a permanent player for them. Yeah, my understanding was to go for trials and come back when the club wants you. They will send. You, they will send for you. Mm -hmm. So, to my surprise, same day I played the match, and the coach said um, he's the right player he's looking for. So I signed the contract, and I was able to read and understand what is in. So that gives me the the highlights, and then know that this is where I am, and that's where what I will get after every match. Um, before the match and all. So what was the contract was very, very appreciated. What made you leave uh, Tel Aviv to join the Anna Israeli club? Yeah, I played the two teams in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. um, 
two teams were very, very strong, okay. just like us and Kotoko. To move from one team to another, it's always a problem. Oh, okay. I was able to do that. So the two teams were all in Tel Aviv? In Tel Aviv. So you left So it's the local other. derby. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. But why did you make that decision to join the other, la the other team? Yeah, it was uh, a year left on my contract mm -hmm. and the uh, option was supposed to be exercise and nothing was coming. So I think my agent went to approach the club and the club wasn't giving the heads up. So we decided to move on because as a player, you work with your agent and at the end of the day, you don't wait until the end of your contract, then you ask for another. Your contract needs to be uh, renewed before six months ends. So the other team, Hapoy Tel Aviv, also wanted my signature. So mm -hmm. I left and then I joined Hapoy. Okay. Yeah. So after Hapoy, then you came to England? Yeah. After yeah. Hapoy, I spent two years with Hapoy, two years with Maccabi Tel Aviv. Okay. So uh, 2006 World Cup in Germany. Mm -hmm. That's where I got the opportunity to play in England. Okay. Yeah. What was your first experience playing for, uh, playing on the the World Cup uh, level? Because that was your first time being part of the team, and that was the first time Ghana also qualified to that level. As a young, energetic guy, what was the morale behind you and being selected to be part of the team? What were your, what were the emotions that came to you at that time? Well, at that time, I was just still banging, buzzing, buzzing, buzzing because um, I wanted to achieve. Okay. And when I was in Israel, I used to watch uh, Premier, Premier League, mm -hmm. and I saw that it was competitive, it was very fast. Team that played direct, you can see they play. They play direct. Those who played uh, like Arsenal's, keep the ball built from the back. You could see all that picture. So I prayed that one day, and then that day came, uh, Lampadio, who was a uh, West Ham manager at that time, came to watch the game against uh, Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. Then after the game, he made a decision. And for me, I didn't know who is who, who was who, and who I'm playing against. Just what what I was doing is to play for my country okay. and go for win. Because if you are Ronaldo, if you are whoever, for me, I'm not somebody who plays with names. I only do my job and make sure that I have position that I'm holding. And it's a national team, it's not a club side. Mm -hmm. I always have to make sure that I, I use that position as my own house. I mm -hmm. clean it nicely. So the next time any coach comes, you know that I was doing a good job. So for me, the experience was, was great based on the confidence that I have for myself. Talking about 20, 20, 2006 World Cup, you played against Brazil and you lost 3-0 to them. Uh, how was the feeling? Because you saw the likes of Ronaldinho and the likes. What, what, how, how come you couldn't hold on to? Because you played very well. Uh, so how come you couldn't stop them? Well, I would say 2006 World Cup in January, I think, um, I would say we were inexperienced. We were being naive. Uh, youngsters, who wants to do well, who wants to enjoy the game. You could see our first goal, we were open. The defence line were open, no defensive shape. You can see it wasn't, it wasn't normal. Um, like I said, we were inexperienced. Brazilians were experienced. We were playing all the game, they were scoring. So that tells you who is experienced or who is not experienced. Yeah. They scored three, three goals. I don't know if they will play all. It was 60-40. Uh, so we had a good game, but we lost. But you can see 2010, it was a different transition. But before we come to mm. 2010, when you saw the Brazilian players, the likes of Ronaldinho and the like, uh, were you a bit frightened? Because these were the big guys playing all over the world, world-class players, and you people coming from non really known clubs. Were you frightened? Mm, I will still tell you that I didn't know them. <laughs> yeah, seriously, even until now, when I face somebody on my same uh, level, I still see him as a same personality. Who do well, do well. 
So at that time, with Ronaldo, Ronaldo, Roberto, mm -hmm. I wasn't even focused on them. on them. My focus was to enjoy the game and make sure that uh, uh, Ghana is safe. Well, if you are taking three points, we are taking it. Now after the World Cup, 2006 World Cup, you moved to England, where you played for Fulham, you played for West Ham and then Leicester City. Uh, these three clubs were more of, uh, as you said, uh, the English Premier League is more of an attacking speed game. How were you able to blend within that time that you stayed in England? Yeah, what, what helped me is uh, I was a speed star myself. Mm -hmm. You know, remember I was a striker, then I was tend to become a, oh, really? a right fullback. You didn't know about that. Okay, so today you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was a speed star myself. So when I got there, it was easy for me to uh, cope with the system over there. Because mm -hmm. it was all about speed, technique, composure, and also listening to the coach's instructions and then do what is required on the field, then you are, you are okay. But if you, if you are not able to do those things, that you will face a lot of problems. That's why I was able to play uh, three strong uh, teams in England. Okay, let's, take, let's talk about Fulham. There was a match you played against Manchester United and you won. And you played a key role in that match, stopping Cristiano Ronaldo. How did you do it? Yeah, like I mentioned, um, when a player listening to a coach, okay. before a match, the day before and same day, we call something um, Prozone. You go to Prozone, like you know, you watch the opponent pretty much uh, push. So you watch your opponent, who is playing from your side. And that time we all know Ronaldo likes to play from the left, uh, from his left side, trying to come in and use his right foot to hit. So my manager told me to always show him to his weak leg. Mm -hmm. So it was simple. If, you, if, if he's a right foot, I have to show him the ball to his left, because I know he's no good at his left. So that's what I did, and then I match him boot to boot to the end. I will only allow him to get the ball first, then I will run to his right foot, trying to force him to where he's not comfortable. And he is somebody to, he don't like when there's a pressure on him. He always want it easy. But come on, me, I was coming from Africa. Did you, inti and did you intimidate him? Oh yeah, it's part of the game. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what were some of the things you did to him that really got to him? Oh, you pinch him, you kick him. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those small, small things just to provoke him. Did he and complain? As a, well, oh, he no. complained many times to the referee. And, you know, it's not something that is like a variance or... You no, know, it's part of the, mm -hmm. the, the skill, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were not bothered at all doing that to Ronaldo? Oh, no, no. Like I said, when I'm playing against you, I don't, for me, it's not I'm being disrespectful. I, I don't care who you are. What I care is my position. You don't come and joke there. Okay. He said, when the ball goes, you stay with me. But when I take the ball, you can go. Mm -hmm. So that was my policy. Okay. Tw let's talk about 2010 World Cup. Uh, that has been so far the best team when it comes to the Black Star because you have the best players playing in South Africa, but you lost at the quarter-final against Uruguay. Uh, we're not talking about the penalty, it happens in football, but after you lost that much, what were the words that you told your team? Oh, that day nobody could say a word. Mm -hmm. yeah, we were only listening to people who were consoling us. Okay. Yeah, you guys did well. Next time, I mean, you you make us all proud and all. But we were we were deeply disappointed that we were close to the semi, and at the end of the day, we also thought of how football can be. It's three things in football: losing, drawing, and then winning. So that time, like I said, 2010, we were experienced enough to understand the situation, and reason why we were able to play good football, we were compact, we, we knew what we were looking for. The experience was there, the youngsters and then experience make, coming together. And I think we were having about four categories. Uh, we have the DIU group, 
myself group, uh, Stephen Apia's group, and then uh, Samuel Jan's group. So why would you say group? Yeah, we myself. When I say myself, you have John Mensah, Sule Montari, mm -hmm. and Derek Boateng. Mm -hmm. And then when you go to a Samoyan group, you have a Samoyan, you have a Tuniana, and you have a, a Prince Tego. Okay. And then when you move to Andre. Andrew Ayu, you have Andrew Ayu there. And then we have Kevin Prince Boatin also joining. And then Samuel Inkum. So it's generation by generation. Okay. Then Stephen Apia and Matthew Amua. So that time, the how do I, the structures that Ben Kofi set up, may so rest in peace, set up was uh, the sea that okay. came up for Ghana to enjoy the football. So that was the only thing that makes the team very solid. It was very strong because when players play together for a long time, like myself, I was with John since 2001 to 2010, so you can imagine, say 10 years, 10 years playing together. So when I, even when I'm going to overlap, I know when I go journal who fit in that hole. And when I'm recovering, I know where to recover from. So keeping players for a long time helps. That's why we're able to master the game 2010. You used to have a, a Jesse style. You cut one of the hand and the one was long sleeve and short sleeve. Why, why, what was the most, the, the, the the motivation behind that. Why did you do that? <laughs> because you're, all your guys either short sleeves or long sleeves, but you alone would rather go for the short and long. Why, why that? Good. Um, we were camping in France. Uh -huh. I had a dream that I was playing one short, one long, <laughs> and I performed very well. Mm -hmm. And then after that, a lot of people were saying that ah, you should cut your sleeve one and then long because your game was. Mm -hmm. And we haven't seen anybody using that. That star. So, so when I wake up in the morning, I went to Alex Asante. So it happened in a dream. In the dream, yeah. Okay. So I went to Alex Asante and I said, "When we get to South Africa, my JC, I want one short okay. and then a long. So cut half and leave the other one." And he was he was just laughing. He thought I was joking. Okay. So when we go to South Africa, I insist. The JC came as long, but I cut myself. Oh, you did your own. Yeah, I did your own. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it happened because of the dream. Oh yeah. And I mean, it it, it was something. Yeah, it wasn't happened. something that was planned to. Okay. Yeah, but it happens now, whilst we in camp. Now you left uh, the EPL and came to South Africa. Played for two teams as well. Why South Africa? Because you came back to Africa as well. Why South Africa? Yeah, I think um, South Africa was doing well in terms of the league, the professionalism, and what the Europeans were doing, they were doing the same. Um, players' image rights, uh, salary-wise, facilities. So I saw all that when they host the 2010 World Cup. Yeah, so um, sometimes you, the player, don't point to where you want to play. You only wait for the offer. So that's why you sign for agent to work for you. So the agent came up with the offer that at that time I was changing a contract and there was issue that came that led me to lose my contract in England. What happened? So I am not going to disclose it. <laughs> okay, so a lot of doors were Open. were closed. Okay. Yeah, because that incident that happened was wasn't something that was uh, pleasant. Yeah. So any team that my agent sent me, they said no. But you regret we, that thing that happened to you? I don't regret it because I was innocent. Innocent. Yeah, so when he came up with the, that deal was Santos. Uh, Santos was... Before, did you fight your way to make sure that you were innocent? Or since they all those were Oh yeah, crazy? I did. I grant interviews, but who believe, who believe? It's not everybody that will believe your story. Okay. Yeah, and how the thing came to, it was very, very loud. It was CNN and... Wow. BBC, so you can imagine how this could affect a player. But that's where, as a player, your mental strength comes on. If you don't have a mental strength, you give up and retire. So I went to Santos. Santos was in the lower division from PSL because I had been at home for, let's say, three seasons without a team. 
So you need to start from somewhere. So I went to Santos and then I start. So one season, I got a chance to play for Marisberg United. Okay. Yeah, so I moved to Marisberg. And first season in the history of the club, being the top eight, we push for them to become the top eight uh, team in PSL. Mm -hmm. That's where my name started arising again. So that is where I end up in South Africa. But I don't regret playing in South Africa. Because mm -hmm. South Africa, going there has given me a lot of uh, opportunities. Even to become a coach, uh, first Ghanaian to be a coach in South Africa. Yeah. It was South Africa league that uh, put me through. So it was great. Their league is more professional. Professional. Mm -hmm. Now, if you enter into the realm of coaching, uh, how, how did that come by? Because most footballers, after football, want to go into coaching, but they don't succeed. Uh, we see the likes of Maradona, because even though it's good, but when coaching abilities is not that superb. What would that, how would you be different from the others? Well, um, I become a coach. When I joined Marisberg United, it was uh, Steve Compella, who is now Golden Arrows uh, coach, uh, former Kaiser Chiefs coach. I was assisting him in Kaiser Chiefs. So he was my coach in Marisberg. And I'm, I was a player who always want to be a first at training before even the coach and then players don't arrive. Play with your time. I don't play with my time. So if the training is two, one, I'm there. Okay. So I'll do my own stretching, do my own activities. So by the time the coach comes, I'm prepared. So I think he was monitoring me and he got to a point where the players were also doing the same, were doing the same. And it got to a time all of, of the team will be ready one hour before the training starts. Okay. So now the players start saying, oh, we've learned something different. And sometime I could start, like I would start teaching the boys how to get the first touch and all. So that helped the team that year. So the coach felt that, no, John is a bit of uh, pressure on me. So he advised when he was leaving to Kaiser Chiefs, he said this to me, don't stay long in the game. Okay. You can become a very good coach, but start early. Okay. So after my last season, second season for Marisberg, I left and then I came home. So I told him that um, I'm back home and I'm about to announce my retirement from football okay. and start my coaching. new coaching career. Then he said, that's good. He's in Kaiser Chiefs and my have me as an assistant coach, but you you will write to the club. Then it happens. Then I have to go and do one season with him. With him yeah. yeah. Okay, so I will ask, what is your coaching philosophy? My coaching philosophy? Yeah. It's simple. Like I mentioned, um, first of all, you know, a coach might have his own philosophy, mm -hmm. but when you go to a team, a team has its own, its own. philosophy. Okay. So the two parties need to come together and see which one, or if you can add mine to there. First of all, a team has its own assets that a new, new coach need have to protect it and make sure that the asset is okay. Because sometimes football teams, clubs can stay, everybody will come and go. And I also establish rules in the team. Okay. From, from the rules, come to the playing body and all. So I establish rules. You need to be punctual. And then character, respect, discipline of the pitch and on the pitch. Okay. Yeah. So talking about your coaching ability, as you said, in terms of discipline, have you had any problem with any player who disagree with how you want to run the, your club? I mean, coaching, I mean, you, you did mention about being disciplined. Have you had an encounter where a player dis, disrespected your rules and what was their actions? Oh, um, being a coach, you can't have it all. Okay. Yeah, and you being a coach doesn't mean the player don't have a say. Okay. You see, you as a coach, you are a father to all of them and your attitude will reflect on the players. Okay. So like we say philosophy, 
you use yourself, if you are a good leader, you use it to teach the, the boys how your philosophy is. Because you can't just go and say, this is John, and I'm using Kwesi's behavior. True. Yes, because you yourself need to be disciplined. Okay, so if I'm coming to training and then I forget to comb my hair, I didn't even take a shower, my armpit, sorry to say, it's, you, you understand, you're blowing the players. You lose respect, definitely. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes as a coach, you also need to demonstrate on the field to the players. You see, oh, if the coach is doing, I can also do it. Also do it. And also try to manage the players' stress when they are when they are stressed. Some players who come from home, they don't want to train. You need to know all that. So even when the player is at fault, the player, everybody needs a chance. You call him, you talk to him. He kick his team player on the field and he didn't say sorry. You call him, you talk to him next time, or we've done with the training, go and say sorry because you kick him and you didn't say sorry. You need to watch all that. So from there you win a lot of trust and respect from the players. It's not when player make a mistake straight away. The only thing I won't forgive a player is player coming late. Okay. You, you are allowed to make mistakes in the game. It's part of the game. Okay? You, you can't play 90 minutes, 100 minutes without making a mistake. But if you come late, that one, you won't I, I, I won't tolerate that. Yeah. Okay. Is coaching the Black Star part of your plans in the future? Um, it is well. Um, it, it's a big dream. Okay. It's a big dream, but uh, it's not easy to coach a national team. It's not easy. Yeah, it will start from somewhere. Okay. Talking about the Black Stars, how do you see appointment of CK Akonos? Uh, do you think it's in the right direction, given the the uh, local play, uh, players, people who played for the national team, the opportunity to lead the team, especially? When it comes because we've seen Kwesi Apia doing it and now the turn of uh, Siki Akono. But most of these players you had had problems with our coach, especially when the person is not white. Do you give him your support? And do you think if such incident should happen, how should he handle it? I think CK is the right choice. Kwesi Apia was also right because Kwesi Apia came as assistant coach working under the foreign coaches, mm -hmm. which he knows. Myself, I work under him and I've seen the way, the way he works. 2013 was my last uh, cup for Ghana. Mm -hmm. He was the head coach. And he, somebody is very, he was very straight. Okay. When you see him quiet, you, you don't, don't think he's easy or cheap. He's not a cheap coach, he's not easy to work on. He give you respect, but he don't talk. But when once he make a decision, That's fine. The, the, he will he will never change it. it can be who, who whoever, mm -hmm. yeah. So he did his best, and now we are with uh, Coach Siki Akono, and he has also been in the country as coach many clubs, which the experience is there. In every club that he coached, to, he made good impact. Yeah. And we all know that he also captain the national team, and he was playing good football score free kicks from 40 yards and all, find his right target. And don't forget, he's also a very, very serious uh, man uh, when it comes to disciplined players. Okay. He's also disciplined. You see, this kind of job, without discipline, you can you can't do it. The reason I have confidence in him is with his caps for, for Ghana and his international career coming to Ghana, I mean, giving back to the clubs in Ghana, I think he's the right right man. What he need to get from us to support him. You were uh, you were in charge as the manager or the coach for uh, Legon City FC, um, and we heard that you you turned your you stopped for some time. What happened? Um, I'm a member, okay. board member okay. for Legon Cities. Um, I was you, supposed are to you be. Are you a shareholder of the team? Oh, I'm not coming to that now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right now we're talking as a coach. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I was supposed to be the head coach of the club, mm -hmm. but due to the requirement of uh, the Lances, uh, Lances A, uh, yeah, Lances A, I couldn't meet um, the, requirement. the requirement. So I have to wait for the FA to 
green light as when we can go for the course. Because okay. I can't just get up and say that I'm going to do CAF A. They need, there has to be approval from our superiors. So we wait then. But for now, we are monitoring. And then as a technical man, when I watch the game and I see something, I, I chip in. You did indicate that you remember. There's speculation that John Pencil owns Lincoln City. Oh, you see, um, as a technical man, I'm talking as a technical man. Okay. But when it comes to when we are talking about the club itself, you see, I brought all these ideas, like okay. we have stretches, okay? okay? So whoever talk about the club, we have our spokesman, mm -hmm. as everybody knows him, okay? So if you want to know much about Legon Cities, mm -hmm. who is the shareholder, who is the CEO, I think, he will be the, the right person right too. Person yeah. But for me to sit here and tell you inside about the club, I think I'll be disrespecting the club. I mean, I like that. I like. What's, what's the way forward for John Pinto from now? The way forward is, um, I'm still on my coaching badges. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to come up with uh, a good CV, mm -hmm. which I've started in South Africa. I came home and built some players, waiting for the records to, to come up so I can go for it. I want to become the best successful coach in the world, not only in Africa. I want to challenge. And you can see recently, uh, Scott Parker qualified Fulham to Premier, Premier yes. yeah, and he was my teammate. Okay. You see, so these people motivate us because once a teammate and then he was able to do this, then I can see myself also mm -hmm. doing the same. So. The sky is in the enemy. We are praying for the best. Okay. Is there anything you want to add? Um, stretches is important in Ghana football. Like okay. I said, Ben Kofi did to uh, did for Ghana from 2000, 2000 2001 to 2005 when Ghana qualified for the first time in the World Cup because he he never dis dis dissolved our group. He kept the group play together, play together, so we got to know ourselves more. So I think um, Ghana football, we need to start doing those things again. Like under 17, after under 17, you don't dissolve the group, you keep the same group. Under 20, you keep them. Then from under, under 17, then you're going to represent Ghana for under 20. From under 20, then under 23, before the national team. So once the boys stick together and play more matches, going to games will be easy because I'll use ourselves as an example. When we are going to play, Mike Asien will come, Sule will come, Jomensa will come myself. We said, come on, match we game we need at, at under 20 minutes. So before we get to the field, we know that 20 minutes we are scoring two or one to defend. That is what is going to help Ghana football. It's not good players that win matches, that qualify nations, but it's a good team okay. that can take Ghana far. Okay, your, your nation, you played the national team for some time now. Who would you say was your best friend? Best friend? Yeah. I think I'm one of the people, you know, the guys who don't have best friend. Like I take everybody as my best friend, friend. yeah. Okay. Why didn't you make it? Uh, why didn't you make it to the 2014 World Cup? 2014 World Cup mm -hmm. because I wasn't called to. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't called. Where, to where, what happened? Were you not playing actively? You were. Oh, sometimes it's not about you playing actively or not. What the, um, coach what the coach? Every coach has his own uh, plan for a season or a tournament, and if the coach don't call, it doesn't mean mm -hmm. he, he don't want you but you are not part of his plans. A coach must have a plan because he knows, okay, you're a good player, but at the end of the day, I have a system that I'm playing that you cannot fit to that system. So I think um, I, I did respect that. And then I pray for the team to go ahead and have a successful one. Thank you, John. You're Thank welcome. You be, on, be on the pitch.
pitch. We watch and appreciate the game differently. We capture the emotions and the memories. We tell you the history of your favorite clubs. This is our culture and our story. This is football and it's beyond the pitch. Follow us on all our social media handles. Facebook, Beyond the Pitch. Twitter, Beyond the Underscore Pitch. Instagram, Beyond Underscore The Underscore Pitch. YouTube, Beyond the Pitch. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and never miss another episode. That will be all for today. Join us next time for your favorite football show. This has been Beyond the Pitch.